Hello everyone, today is November 9th, 2018, and this is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank all you guys and girls for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously the elephant in the room is, is the bear in the room, <laughs> or potential bear, I should say. So we'll certainly talk about that. Your questions on trading your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, keep your questions relative to the slides until we get towards the end of the presentation. I'll open it up for everyone when that occurs, if you have some other questions. And your favorite stock picks, hold off on those until we get to the charts. And those are just to keep me from going off on a tangent on my ATD from kicking in. When we do get to the live charts, if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time, and that's for your benefit. So this week's focus is going to be bear market, and I've got a little question mark here, update, signs, and signals. And we're going to take a look at that in a lot of details. And then one thing I've been kind of holding off on doing, because it, it can come across as being hindsight is 2020, or the fish had got away, or pouring salt into the wounds, as we'll say in a minute, as I'll show you in a minute or two. But it's very important that you understand discretion when it comes to trades and there's some very small tweaks you can make and I'm going to explain to that explain why that is in a lot of detail before we do all that there's a disclaimer screen as you know you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up a lot more succinctly succinctly that's hard for me to say all predictions about the future a lot of stuff can happen between now and then so the question is is winter still coming and as i've been saying over weeks past all of your major tops or bottoms will have some sort of transitional pattern such as bow tie or first thrust and we're going to look at some daily signals here in just a minute and we're on the cusp of some potential weekly signals now where the, will this little rally we just had negate some of that i don't think so not not yet at least and we'll flesh that out so would you have a sell signal, or I should say every top is going to have some sort of sell signal to it. So if you take a look at the Russell not that long ago, we had a bow tie down, and so far we had a pretty serious slide down from that. If you go back and look at last week's and week before presentation and yesterday's question and answer on the members' site, we talked about the weekly bow ties, and we do that ad nauseum, obviously, and how they signify every major bull and bear market, at least over the past 20-something years, even longer. Now, the question is, when you have a signal, one of the things that I often say is that signal remains in place until taken out. And before we do that, let's take a look at the weekly bow ties. Okay, this is what I, this is the slide I was looking for. Sorry about that. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But the weekly basis, if you take a look, and as I just said, I probably should have left the slide in, but it's, I've showed it so many times. I know you guys are sick of looking at it. But pretty much every bull and bear market, especially over the last 30 years, begins with a weekly bow tie down or some of these other signals. I'm going to show you in just one second. So you can see that on a weekly basis, even with the retrace rally, the moving averages have turned down significantly. Now, one thing I'm noticing this morning, and this is just something that I went over when we talked about moving averages, and I think it's all in the free course if you go to learning management system on the members area, is that notice that the 20 exponential and 30 exponential actually have turned up. Why? Well, because price crossed above it. Now, if price crosses back below it, it's going to turn right back down. So that's what the weekly bow ties look like. If we have a weekly bow tie sell signal, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. We had one of them in 2015, and I think the market dropped about 10% from that. Uh, Russell dropped about 18% from that. So for all intents and purposes, at least how the media defines it, that was pretty much a bear market. So we'll have to keep an eye on this weekly bow tie in here. Now, I came up with a simple little system. It basically, it said, okay, 
as long as the market is less than 10 percent away from its 50-week highs let's stay long and provided of course you have at least two days of Dave light and that just means that the low for those of you who don't know what it is and again go through the introduction materials but the lows are greater than the moving average you could draw an arrow or a line in between the price bars of the moving average you could see light between the lows okay now if the market is 10 percent or more away from its 50-week high and it closes below its 50 week simple moving average then that is a sell signal so as you can see at the bottom it's to stay bullish as long as we're less than 10 percent away from the old highs the whole theory behind this system is just technical analysis 101 you have point a point b and point c and if a market's going to go from a to c it's going to have to pass through b along the way so my theory is if it's going to go from C and beyond, beyond C, then as long as it's near C, somewhere in here, somewhere between B and C, then stay long, okay? But if it begins dropping from C and going back towards B, and that little magic number just for the indices, now it's going to be different on individual stocks because an individual stock might move 10% in one afternoon or one hour, okay? But for the indices, 10% seems to be a good number. And the other way of looking at this system is, in most simplest terms, if a market is going to lose 50% of its value in a bear market, such as 2009 or 2000, in the subsequent bear markets that followed, 2008, I should say, and then 2000, then that market's going to lose 10% of its value first. So that's sort of your stop out point at 10%. And that's all I'm seeking to define here. Now, interesting enough, if you take a look at the weekly chart, we almost had a signal back in April. And now we almost, here we go, right here. Sorry about that. Let's fix this. We almost had a signal back in April. We didn't quite get above that 10% drop, and we also did not close below the 50-week moving average. Now, for those who are wondering, we don't require Dave Light on the downside because we want to make sure we get out the way, but we also want to have a little bit of a whipsaw filter in there. So what we're using is a close below the moving average. But you can see now we're getting pretty close to this. But now, if we stay up here on the P's, we're back above that 50-week moving average. So, so far, if you want to look at things longer term, we have dodged a bullet. Now, that doesn't mean you hold on to your portfolio or your longs in your portfolio come hella high water. You have stops in place. And right before this big slide, we had one position that was still on on the long side, and it stopped out at a profit overall. I think it was a scratch on the second half, if memory serves. I have the spreadsheet I'll pull up in a minute. Anyway, so we followed our plan and we got stopped out and we actually started shorting. Why? Well, that's what the database was producing. But it does help to wrap your head around where we are from a bigger picture perspective. And then, as I sort of alluded to, not that I want to give out direct trading advice, which legally I cannot, by the way. So everything here is for educational purposes only. Read the disclaimers. Lots of interesting stuff in there, like if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast and things like that. Anyway, but if you are trying to time the market much, much longer term, let's say in a 401k or something, then you can look at a system like this and say, okay, we're on the cusp of being in trouble here but let me just hold tight for now and I can live through a 10% slide but I can't live through a 50% slide or more and then the other thing also to realize is and I say this each week I actually took the slide out thinking that I wouldn't say it 
But as Greg Moore says, whipsaw is a frustrating bear market. It's a de devastating. So when you do exit in a year like, let's say, 2015, 2016, and now, again, the, the Russell, after we had some signals, dropped 18%. That's nothing to sneeze at. But when you do exit after those signals and the market goes back up to make new highs and you're forced back in, that's okay. It's okay to lose a little bit of money and then lose a little bit of opportunity costs and get back in. That's what you do as a trader, especially if you're taking a longer-term view for some type of longer-term investments. Now, I often preach there are no good longer-term investments. I'm not suggesting you have longer-term investments. What I am saying, though, is if something is going up longer-term, then it's okay to stay with it longer-term until proven otherwise. And something as simple as this little 10% system here or a weekly bow tie will give you a pretty good idea. So we're a little bit less than 10% away from those all-time highs or for the system purposes, 50-week highs. So we're not going to get too excited about where the market is longer term. And again, it does not mean we throw caution to the wind. We get stopped out on longs. We stopped out on longs. Okay. And then again, we're back above the 50-week moving average. Nothing magical about the 50-week. It's so funny. I, I did all this bow tie studies with the weekly bow ties, which people it t tend to have um, glommed onto and really like. But one thing I've noticed by accident, I have a 50-week moving average plot, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, just simple Dave light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average, can do a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. So we're back above the 50. We do not have Dave light above the 50 just yet, okay? And then notice the little indicator on the bottom. It stays bullish as long as you have what? Dave light and you're less than 10% away, okay? It goes neutral when you, when the price bars intersect the moving average and or you're greater than 10% or equal to 10% away from high. So then it goes bearish when you have a close down here below the moving average, and then this is greater than or equal to 10% above. So you can see we, we bullish, we went neutral, and then now we're neutral again because so far, and then let me back this out a little bit. If you notice just this little blip here, we did go positive for a second or two, or a week I should say, because we got back above the 50 and we have that Dave light and then we were less than 10 percent away now my whipsaw filter is two bars of above and that's why we didn't get a buy signal in here because we just had one bar above okay and if that doesn't make sense if you go in and watch several of the last presentations it will now as I often preach you can't have a bear market without downside Dave light. So this is a slide we've been showing quite a bit. And this illustrates the point I was making earlier, like, okay, my bow ties, my weekly bow ties are great and fantastic. Well, I often preach a lot of times I'll go see presentations and I'll think to myself, boy, they could just use a moving average and make things simple, simpler than what they have. And then I kind of dose my own medicine when I know this, I wait a minute, something as simple as Dave light meaning that the lows are less than a moving average for bear markets or greater for bull markets, can do a pretty good job of keeping you on the right side of the market. So everywhere it's green, you would stay long. Everywhere it's red, you would be cautious and possibly short. And if it just turns a little green or a little red somewhere in between, then maybe you're a little bit more neutral. Now, again, we're letting the ebb and flow of the portfolio tell us what to do. And then, as I've been saying at nauseam, one of the gleamings in playing with this, and this is programmed into Metastock. If you have Metastock, the newer version, you'll have this indicator. If you don't have it, use the link on my website if you don't mind, and email me if you need that. But notice that when we get to about 100 or so, the market tends to correct from those levels. Okay. 
and you can see we got pretty high in here recently. And then when this price intersects at moving average, it resets back to zero and the count starts over. So this was where we were last week. We had a couple of kisses of the moving average. And then now, obviously, we're back above it. But this count here is still at zero. And it's going to stay at zero until the low, or unless the low, is greater than the moving average. Then the count will start over. And again, remember I said back in 2015, 2016, we had some other signals triggering, but notice that things did go red back then. And then the market began to look a little iffy. You can see it sold off, and then it sold off again. And that's back then, again, that's when, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but that's back with the Russell lost 18% of its value. Now, as I showed last week, it could be a big process type of tops. As I've said quite a bit, sometimes a top is a process more than an event. Everybody thinks that a, that a top's an event because it's so painful and the market like does that, right? Well, a lot of times before it does that, it does this for a long, long, long time. So go back to the beginning of 2018. And where are we now? Where were we? So this whole thing, and I'm going to use the word hope, but this whole thing, and I hope it's not, but this whole thing could be a big old top. At the least, we haven't made any forward progress in a long, long time. So now you have to start to draw your arrows, your big blue arrow. You have to start drawing a sideways arrow. Okay. Well, what about the death cross? Media gets their panties all in a wide when the death cross begins to unfold. I wouldn't get too excited about the death cross in and of itself, but as I preach, it's the magnitude of what possibly could happen next. Just like in the S&P 500, it was somewhat of a whipsaw when we had some sell signals in 2015, 2016, and in the Russell, it wasn't again. It was a little bit more serious there. And if we do get a death cross, it could just be a whipsaw. The point is not to trade these signals mechanically, but to pay attention because the magnitude of what happens afterwards could be very important. And I'm going to show, flesh that out in just one second. But you can see what's happening, as I've been saying quite a bit, is we're adding in lower prices than we're taking off if you go back 50 days in time. But you can see that with this little rally we had, that's going to probably cause this moving average to flatten out a little bit. So we might not get that cross as fast as it appears here. So this might flatten out over the next few days if we stay up here. And eventually, obviously, you'll be adding in prices at lower levels and then prices at lower levels and it's going to balance out. But the drop-off effect in and of itself, a lot of times if a market doesn't even trade higher, will force that moving average lower. Now, what's really interesting is this is the Russell 2000. And as you can see, it's a lot more impressive here because we're adding in prices down here and we're taking off prices from up here. And if this thing begins to sell off again, then it's really going to drop significantly. And you can see this 200-day moving average has flattened out. What's interesting is the 200-day moving average in the S&P 500 has actually turned down. But you can see that we could have a death cross fairly quickly here in the Russell 2000. Now, I'm getting a lot of questions on this. And this is we covered this in a lot of detail in yesterday's question and answer. What do you mean by a top remains in place? And most of the questions are vis-a-vis -vis something like a bow tie. Well, if we take a look at the S&P 500, you can see that we bow tied down recently and sold off fairly hard. And again, this is Metastock. This is just, I didn't draw these in. This is the actual system recognizing these. Not a huge fan of having the system recognize everything for me, but you can see it's pretty cool when it works. I prefer to just look at the charts. 
But you can see we had a bow tie down, we had a pretty serious slide, and now obviously we started to retrace back up. Now, my point is that that top signified by that bow tie remains in place because that was off of an all time high. So until and unless we hit an all time high, that top remains in place. Now, I think, excuse me, I think where the confusion comes in is people are thinking like, well, you sell here and then you buy back in here or something or wait for some other signal. No, you would still apply money management, a trailing stop, take partial profits, etc. It's just that you would say, stay cautious with the market until unless it made new highs. So everybody's asking me, Dave, when do we get back in? Well, I would wait until this market got to new highs and hopefully be on before getting too excited about the long side in general. Doesn't mean that I won't take a long side setup. We've got two in the portfolio right now, and I think I've got one left over from before this slide even. Now, if you take a look at the Russell, a little bit more impressive on that bow tie slide that we saw recently. And that top remains in place until and unless those old highs get taken out. It doesn't mean that if you took this short from 165 that you didn't take profits somewhere along the way, because that's a pretty damn serious slide, okay? And it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have a trailing stop in place to get you out. So you still use the money management. One thing I was thinking about yesterday and doing some Q&A and working on some presentations is that a setup gets you into the market and the money management gets you out. So a lot of things could happen in between. You might actually have an opposing signal, but if your money management, if your money and position management is such that you are in longer term trend following mode through that loosening of that trailing stop, did you just pay attention to that trailing stop and don't worry about opposing signals within the market that you're in? So if you start trend following in an index, which by the way, it's much harder to trend follow in an index than it is in a more inefficient market, such as an individual stock, especially something like an IPO or something, because the index is going to go up 100% overnight, whereas an IPO might. Anyway, once you make that transition to a longer term trend follower, then your stop becomes your exit signal. Now, there are systems that what they call stop and reverse. That's not the type of system that I trade. That's not my methodology. My methodology is to get in for a short-term move and then via taking partial profits and a gradually widening stop, sticking with that position as long as possible, hopefully weeks, months, and years. Now, a couple of observations that I'm seeing right now. In fact, some of the people in here, right here, says looks like a buy. Okay. Well, I think it's a little too soon to start kissing each other just yet when it comes to this market, as I said in the market in a minute this morning. And there's a lot of bottom picking at tops. And by that, I'm not talking about the daily chart, but you've got a rollover like this. And then everybody's like, oh, it's 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 over with. Let's start buying. Now that might be the low. We may have seen the low. Okay. But I'm not going to get excited again until this market goes on to make new highs. So I think it's a bad idea to start picking bottoms in this market when so far it just looks like a big picture retrace. As you know, when a market sells off from high levels, you can have a very serious retrace. And sometimes it rolls right back over. Okay. So as far as I'm concerned, I think we're just at a retrace. What I hope, I hope it goes higher and keeps going higher, okay? But the reality is I think we're still in trouble. And until proven otherwise, I'm not going to get too excited about the overall market. Doesn't mean that I won't take a setup what I see it at a long side. So for now, I would remain cautious. Again, it ain't over till it's over when it comes to tops and bear markets and retraces and all that other good stuff. What I would encourage you to do, though, is stay setup driven. 
So if you're seeing a bunch of shorts and you can't find a long to save your, save your life, then maybe you want to be on the short side. If you start seeing some really good looking longs, what I would suggest you do is make sure you think they have the potential to trade in lieu of a questionable market. So I guess the thing I should point out is I often do a blog where I talk about you got to be really careful to label yourself. So am I bearish? Probably. Okay. But if I had to label myself, maybe I'm cautiously optimistic. Okay. I'm cautiously optimistic that these signals we see back here might be over with, but I'm not going to get too excited until and unless the market makes new highs. Now, if we're down here making new lows and the big blue arrows obviously pointed lower longer term, we got longer term weekly signals, then I might have to have to admit that I'm a little bit bearish. So people get confused when I talk about the market looks like it's in trouble or I tell them we're seeing signals at all. They think I'm Mr. Bear. It doesn't mean that I'm Mr. Bear. It just means I'm believing in what I see and not in what I believe, which is very important to do in the markets. What is, is. All right, any questions on where we are? And we'll get to the live charts in a minute, so we could certainly pull up some live charts, or we certainly will when we get to the, when we get to the market. Okay, I'm gonna breeze through this slide pretty quick because we covered it quite often in many prior lessons, but just to kind of rehash real quick, Discretion and micromanagement kind of seem like the same thing, but they're not. Discretion is using your brain to generally improve your performance, and micromanagement is abandoning the original plan in an attempt to outsmart the market. This position has gone far enough. This position is dead money. It's not going anywhere. Many, many, many clients. The day before we have 20% or more big moves, I'll get emails. This has happened throughout history as long as I've been doing this for 20-something years. Hey, Dave, I'm out of this stock. It's going nowhere. And then what happens is Murphy would have, the next, have it the next day it takes off. So you're abandoning the original plan and attempt to outsmart the market. Now, discretion, on the, on the other hand, let me rewind that. Discretion, on the other hand, is minor tweaks while not drifting too far away from the core methodology. In some cases, as you'll see in just one second, it might be the difference between your success, might be the difference between a few cents, literally a few cents, and sometimes it comes down to the penny. Now, as usual, and as I preach, and here comes the silly little slide one more time, a picture I should say, micromanagement can often pay over the short term. It can actually often pay over the intermediate term, okay? But never longer term. Especially if you are a trend follower and your success depends upon the occasional outlier, which we're going to drive the point home in just one second. As I preach, the market can be a really bad teacher. It can lull you into a false sense of security. One thing from a psychological perspective that I see a lot, happen to a lot of people over the years, and you know what? Everything I tell you, I've been guilty of at one point in the past, maybe even recently. So I fight these same battles, but it will make you think that you're smarter than you really are, micromanagement that is. Now, I don't want to pour salt into your wounds by showing you what could have, should have happened with some of these positions. Just remember that I've been doing this or showing these presentations with the micromanagement versus discretion and then more specifically using the discretion to enhance your performance. I've been showing those presentations or giving those presentations for a long, long time. And the secret is the occasional outlier, and a tiny bit of discretion will help you catch that occasional big winner. So I don't want to pour salt in your wounds, 
And I always apologize when I give these, but I can guarantee you at some point in the near future, or not too near future, I should say, we will have another one of these discretion examples that could pay off really big. And if you get educated, you're well on your way. Now, before we talk about these individual examples, keep in mind that discretion does take a little bit of discipline. If you're not disciplined, follow things a little bit more mechanically until you prove you can do the process and then slowly ease into discretion. You can't let a market get away from you. We're making minor tweaks. We're giving things a little bit more wiggle room to hold on to positions. We're not throwing caution to the wind. Now, with that said, let's take a look at a couple current and recent examples here. So GDDY set up as a potential short with an entry of 75. And it triggered here and then went down and hit the initial profit target of 67. Now, when that happens, you bump your stop down to break even on the remainder. So the worst thing can happen, barring overnight gaps, of course, is you scratch out on the remainder of your shares. And notice that it did rally up and push slightly through that stop before, of course, rolling right back over. Now, this isn't a perfect example. It didn't go to the penny, but it only went 85 cents above the stop, and this was on a $75 stock. So percentage-wise, it's not a whole lot. And if you took partial profits on the position to begin with, then you're only risking an additional 124 and you already made per 100,000K account, you've already made $1,000. So you still have a profitable position overall when you're applying a little bit of that discretion. And then you can see the difference is that 124 additional risk, not that it always will work, but in this particular case, that 124 additional risk turned into 1,065 additional profits based on last night's close. And the position is still open just in case it runs much further. Now, let's take a look at the chart zoomed in. And what you'll see is your stop was right there. And often, if you're following me, I'll say, hey, guys, look, we're getting really close to the stop. Let's make sure we give it a little bit of room tomorrow on the open because if it's this far away, the chances are pretty good that, that market's going to spike up, get that stop, and we don't know if it's going to keep on going. So obviously, as I preach, you have to have some sort of uncle point in mind where you decide to get out, no questions asked. So again, when it's really close to that stop, especially when you got a market like this, or you have a market like this, I should say, that closes well, in other words, towards the top of its range, and it's really close to that stop. The next morning, just pay attention to see if it spikes up a little bit on the open. And if it doesn't quite hit on the open and, and comes back in a little bit, then maybe you can give it a little bit extra wiggle room, put in a hard stop, and go about your life. I don't want you, or I don't suggest that you watch a screen all day. I'm occasionally guilty of that. And I get myself into a lot of trouble when I do that. Now, here's one that I really was worried about, salt and wounds, but it's just such a great example. I couldn't help myself and not, or I said I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this one. So this was Pulte that triggered way back in February. And initial profit target was down here. And you can see that stock just went all over the place for a while. But it didn't do anything wrong by, in other words, hitting the stop. And then, as I said before, the top remains in place until taken out. However, what's going to get us out? The protective stop, which is not quite way up here at the top. But notice that it came up and it just barely nicked the stop by four cents. Okay. So if you multiply that four cents by the number of total shares, because this was a full position here, 
Remember, in the tracking sheet, we divide the position into two loaves, a trending loaf and a trading loaf. And this is just calculated for you. Obviously, you'd want to round those up or down, whatever case may be. But a full position would be 434 shares per $100,000 in your account. In a case like this, that additional four cents would have paid off that additional $17 risk for four cents. You would have hit the initial profit target, and then you still have an open position with fairly decent profits in it. I can't guarantee it always will work, but in the cases it doesn't, you you drop an F-bomb, you move on, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and then you start all over again. The point I'm trying to make is that incremental risk can pay off really, really big. And if it doesn't, so what? The next halfway decent trade will cover all that and then some. And then the occasional outlier caught could be worth 10 times or maybe 100 times or even 1,000 times that initial, that additional risk. So if you went back and looked at these two examples in the portfolio and added them up, Pulte and GoDaddy, so the Pulte was back here in February. These are closed trades, mechanically closed trades, that is. You could see that the difference between those two slight discretionary trades, and one reason I'm kind of driving the point home now is on the short side, a lot more discretion is usually needed than on the long side. If the market's in a longer term bull trend, then things tend to go up and you're less likely to get stopped out. On the short side, you have these very sharp retrace rallies. Now, getting back to this, the point is just that added little discretion, a few cents or 100 bucks or so on a big account, maybe that's less than a tenth of a percent additional risk altogether, can make the difference between a nicely profitable period. You didn't set the world on fire, but that's a pretty decent profit over that period of time versus a negative period. So I just want to show you these things. Again, not to pour salt in the wounds, but I guarantee you somewhere between now and the next presentation that I do on micromanagement, and I'm sorry, on discretion, there'll be another or several great examples where you could stick with them. And again, you usually know the night before whether or not you're going to have to apply a little bit of discretion. Okay. Now we talked a lot about market timing and bow ties and weekly bow ties. And one thing that I haven't talked about much lately is the empirical research that goes in to the market timing. We talked a lot about it yesterday in the Q&A. Now, all that is in the mini market timing course. And if you look on my website, you should have a little banner ad like this. And if you can't find it, just go to members area. And you could sign up to be a free member and you'll get the course. If you've already signed up to be a free member, go to the free stuff page and the course is on there. There's a start course there and then there's a market timing course. If you're a gold member, just go straight to methodology market timing because that's going to be a little bit bigger. This is just a mini course here, whereas the market timing is going to be a little bit larger. And I add to that in time or will add to that in time, I should say. OK. Right as I'm going live or a few minutes ago, I should say, I got a question on NIO. And what did I think about it? Well, this is one that I did watch for a while, and then I gave up on it because it went down. But at this juncture, for me to get excited about it, it would have to come up here and make a new closing high. And if it did that with Dave Light, okay, like we had here, then that would trigger that five-period IPO SMA breakout system. I don't have a good name for that yet. I got to put my name on it though. My wife told me stop making up stuff without your name. Put on it. Do what John, do what John Bollinger does. <laughs> so I have to remember that. 
Now, with IPOs, when they first come public, there's a wonderful opportunity, but even much, much longer term, there can be opportunities. So I have a lot of little patterns that focus way back here where the IPOs first come public, and it's kind of like the ABC thing, okay? If this IPO is going to go to C, let's put C up here, it's going to pass through B way down here, okay? So this is time, obviously, down here. Your big opportunities are here, but you can get secondary signals somewhere from here on. So this IPO might take off and give you a nice little pullback, okay? Or they might die out and flatten out for weeks, months, and even a year or two, and then begin to take off to get their act together. So sometimes companies come public a little too early, they get their act together, and then they take off again. So it's kind of that Phoenix characteristic but it's a little bit more compressed. So let's get back to the NBIO, or NIO, I should say. Now, I think it's a little too soon for a Phoenix type of strategy. If this was a few months in the future, I'd be more excited about buying it down here on a bow tie or a first thrust or something. But let it prove itself or let it continue to bottom out before getting too excited. So at this juncture, again, it would possibly have to come up here. Maybe if over the next few weeks it did kind of take off and then pull back a little bit, I would reevaluate it. But right now it's, it's just going sideways and consolidating. So I would not see this as a viable setup. It is in my IPO list. It is a very thick IPO. I think it's a Chinese electric car maker or something like that. So it could be some potential here, and it does look like a big double bottom. Now, we don't trade off double bottoms, but we observe them, okay? And that's right around the low from the first day. So maybe, just maybe, it'll set up sometimes in the future, but it's not set up just yet. And ideally, I'd like to see it base for two or three months. Everybody forget about it, and then all of a sudden, the stock begins to wake up again. Okay, this is left over from last week, but... I did a presentation on those who really want to be successful and those who don't. And, uh, and the, the defining thing that I've seen over the years is people who invest in themselves. And again, it doesn't have to be my stuff. But as I said last week, if you are trading trend and it is conceptually correct, it's going to look a lot like my stuff. And if you are having difficulties, we could see where you are in the courses. And if you're having trouble getting your head wrapped around why it's so difficult to trade, or if your money management just isn't quite right, then we can look in here and see whether or not you completed these courses, and then that might be all it stands between you and your success. So check out the members area. You can start it for free on that. All right, let's open it up for questions in general, and then let's take a look at the, the market, the live market, I should say and see where we are. Okay, Howard says, as I put my glasses on, the strength of the DJ30 looks much better than the SPX. Well, I don't really care about the DJ that much, but we certainly can take a look at that. Well, it does, and it looks okay, but so far, even in the Dow, to me, it just looks like a big picture retrace, and this is the point I was making. I don't want to try to pick a top. I'm sorry, pick a bottom at a top. Now, you could pick a bottom at a bottom, and I wouldn't say pick a bottom, but I would say have some kind of signal. So like a 2009, if you get a weekly bow tie, or 2002, 2003, that big old fat bottom we had back then, the market's already down 50%. So yeah, you can look for a turnaround. When you're up at these high levels, I think it's a bad idea to try to pick a bottom at a top, okay? And that's what I'm seeing a lot of people do right now, is just look for the silver lining in everything, or look for the, look for the good and not the bad.
All right, let's take a look at the peas. You can see we've had a pretty serious retrace in here. It always amazes me. You have the mother of all up days, and the next day the market just shrugs its shoulders. You know, uh, what I would recommend to do you do for the somewhat aggressive is keep an eye out. I was kind of bummed out this morning when it didn't happen, but keep in keep an eye out to see if we get a big fat opening gap reversal. This market is very overbought. Just like it was very oversold, it was down here. Not that you want to buy a market was oversold, a seller market was overbought. But if you're looking to play a little opening gap reversal day trade, okay, in general, I'm against day trading. But, hey, if the market gives you a gift and this thing gaps sharply higher and then comes right back in, it can make for a wonderful little trade. When was this? Thursday or Friday I played one. It was fantastic, okay? It happens, and when it happens, it can be a really pretty thing. Let's take a look at the spiders so we'll get a better picture of it happening. Okay. So yesterday really bummed me out because we had a great gap open, had a little bit of a dip, a little fake out move, and then it, bam, went straight up. I was really looking forward to come back in. Not that I wanted the market to go down. I just wanted an opportunity to pick up a little cash. Now, if you look at the spiders or the S&P or whatever you want to look at, you'll notice that in a lot of cases you have this sharp, what I call a witch hat pattern. Looks like a witch's hat. This happens more on the short side, or I should say, I don't really trade these on the long side, but on the short side, they could pay off very nicely. This is especially true if you're in a, long, if you're in a longer term downtrend and a market comes flying off the lows and turns right back down. So I think we're on the cusp of a possible another rollover. But hey, you know, I can't argue with the fact that, you know, what's my old mantra? As long as we're not too far away from the old highs, air on the side of the longer term trend. But in this case, so far, I think we're in a retrace. If we get a little further up, then maybe I'll start giving the market the benefit of the doubt. But so far, I still think the market's in trouble. NASDAQ, not quite as good as the P's, or doesn't look quite as good as the P's. You could see same sort of witch hat kind of in the works there, too. Sharp retrace back up, okay? So I wouldn't get too excited about the NASDAQ just yet, or any other index for that matter. Now, Russell 2000 should be a little bit more obvious than the Russell 2000. And this is the witch hat pattern I'm talking about once you're in a bit of an established trend. So if we, let's say we come up to 160 or so-ish, they begin to stall out, that could be a possible reshort or shorting opportunity. I really want to look at it, okay? Now in the sectors, let's just throw some moving averages in for S&Gs. And by the way, look at Russell. You can see you're getting closer and closer to that 200-day moving average. It's kind of interesting that Ron Grice, and I did the presentation two or three years ago, back when we had a potential death cross in the work works. I didn't realize until I was looking at my old slides, I actually had to get them off of YouTube. But I noticed that the study that he did, he did is when you have a crossing when they're both headed lower, the 200-day moving average and the 50-day moving average are both headed lower. And just to give him a shout out, I think his website is thechartstore.com. Pretty sure that's it. If not, Google him. Anyway, he did a lot of studies on Death Cross, which was really useful. And again, my big epiphany from the Death Cross is not so much like, oh my God, we got a Death Cross, but the magnitude of what potentially happens next. And you can see back here in the Russell, that was a pretty ugly run lower. Okay. And I bet if we went way back in time, just for S and G's. Somebody asked me what that is. What's S and G's, Dave? It's like, well, it's what my British friends say all the time. So if we go back to 2009, let's see if we could find it. So as I've been preaching, and oh, lo and behold, you did have a cross back up. Okay, I didn't know you had a cross back up right here. But the point I was going to make is that okay, well, you get a sell off. It's the magnitude of the sell-off after the death cross, 53%, and not the signal 
in and of itself. So I guess you had two different signals there. But you could see after both of them, you had a pretty serious sell-off. It won't always happen, but you take, again, you need to take all sell signals seriously. So as we go through these sectors, you can see that some areas, if we look at these major sectors here, have already death crossed to the downside. And you take something like chemicals, you got a sharp retrace into a big old fat area of overhead supply. So that sector still looks like it's in trouble. Let's take a look at the energies. Okay, not quite a death cross, but you can see the energies are retracing back up towards this big old fat overhead supply. Metals and mining, death cross there. Just kind of chopping around. Conglomerates made a death cross a long time ago. Durables cross back below. Non-durables, kind of interesting, interesting that non-durables aren't really doing that great in spite of the market being questionable. Automotive. Food and beverage, another one of those defensive areas, so-called defensive areas, not really setting the world on fire. And you can see that you had your death cross earlier this year there. Banks. So as you go through these, you can see most of these look pretty ugly. Now, I don't, I prefer to use the XLF, by the way, instead of this Morningstar Industry Group financials, because this has a lot of mutual funds in it or uh, companies, I should say, that are asset management. But notice, just to look at this, Notice how beautiful that witch hat is after this pretty serious sell-off. So I think this is a market that's still in trouble. But let's just look at XLF. I just looked up SGs as a Brit. I have never heard this before. Huh. Not a common expression, methinks. Oh, well, maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm friends with some cockney types. <laughs> I got friends in low places. All right. Well, Phil's a high class Brit. Okay. I can't say what it is because I got demonetized on YouTube last time I used that phrase. <laughs> anyway, if you look at the actual financials or financials basis, the XLF, you can see it looks a lot like the financials at MG. Not quite as ugly, but ugly nonetheless. And then, of course, you've got your crossing to the downside. So, as we go through these, you've got a few of them taken off in here like insurance, but I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet until they prove themselves further, okay? And even in the drugs, even though you had this big retrace up, for me to get excited about a market at high levels that's had a spill, again, not to beat that horse, but it would actually have to go on to make new highs for me to get excited overall. Yeah, and giggles. It's and giggles is what it is. <laughs> All right, we need to find the origin. That'll be some homework for you guys. Figure out what the origin of that is. Health services, which has been doing really, really well lately. Health services, which has been well, no pun intended, still has that witch hat slash retrace look to it. And it would be hard for me to get excited about this sector overall. So the point is, most areas, as you can see, still look like they're in a whole lot of trouble. Now, let's check back often. Because some areas, for instance, like retail, we're not that far from all-time highs. We start banging out all-time highs in retail, then maybe at least that particular sector has dodged the bullets. Yeah, Jim's got it right. So how come all my Americans know what it is, but my uh, – I think we only have one Britain here today. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's open it up for individual stock questions. So I think the bottom line is market's still a little questionable at best. Let's take a look at bonds while we're waiting on questions. And this might be a good example of the death cross, okay? So we death cross way back here, and that was the ultimate top in bonds, and then we had a pretty serious slide. Now, you know, again, sit around and wait to cover your shorts until you cross back up, but you can see a pretty serious slide happened afterwards. And then if you look at this last cross here, so far that top remains in place, and that's pretty ugly, okay? So I'd like to see bonds get off their buttocks. And even if they do, we still have a lot of overhead supply, so bonds look like they're in trouble. Not that I want to get into or deeply into intermarket technical analysis, but obviously if the bonds continue to slide, 
that's going to start putting pressure on the overall market. Okay. All right. Individual, any individual stock picks you guys want to take a look at? Got a quite bunch today. There's not a plethora of setups right now, so maybe that might be part of it. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, uh, Donald, I talked about that one last night in my uh, – I guess we could talk about it. I mentioned this one in the service last night. This is one that I am watching. Um, it can trade kind of thinly, okay? And I was kind of looking at this one as like a new closing high type of thing, but it's just really, really thin. I mean, technically, that buy would have been yesterday on that one. Or one, two, three, four, four, or day before. But, yeah, definitely keep this one on your watch list and maybe wait for a, a second pullback on that one. But good eye. A very, very thin stock, so be careful on that. TPH. Try point. This is a home builder. Now, uh, you want to short it, Phil, or what do you want to do with that? If you want to short it, then... Uh, I prefer to find something at high levels just rolling over. If you want to get long, I hear you. It's a bit of a first thrust, but that's only a two-point move. And I know it's a REIT. Well, it's not a REIT. It's a construction stock. You got a lot of overhead supply. And then let's take a look at what material construction is doing. Okay, material construction, just not looking too good. Draw your arrows here. Kind of made a witch hat. That's almost a textbook sort of witch hat. You have been long, short, and now long. Yeah, I'm just not seeing it, okay? I mean, I hear you. It's coming off the lows, but it's getting ready to run into a bunch of overhead supply. And now is not the market to be bottom fishing and something that's still in a longer-term downtrend. Knock is a short. Well, it looks okay, but what I would suggest you do is Find something that's still way up here as a short as opposed to something that's in a little bit longer term downtrend. I can't argue with this because while it's not a perfect setup, it did break down from this range and now it's got this overhead supply. And if you shorted it, let's say around 270 or so, and you had a stop way up in this range, I think it could possibly work. So good eye, okay, Mike, good job on that. But try to find something. Let me see if I can find you. Try to find something like the GoDaddy that's still at fairly high levels, although it's not set up. We had a lot of them. I could show you some that we were recently long. No. Like we're short into – that's not a great example. We had a few that we were short recently that set up again, and I think GDDY was probably a pretty good example of that. Uh, although you had a small gap here, it wasn't that significant. And so you've got that second little pullback in here. So that would have been a, a reshort on that. So try to find something that's still at fairly high levels. And I think that's where your big opportunity is going to be. Netflix as a short. Let's take a look at that for Shauna. Good to see you. Um, well, a couple of caveats. It's a little wide and loose, okay? But... And let's back the chart way out. And it's at pretty high levels. I would say I don't like the fact that it's wide and loose, but I can't argue with you a lot on this one because it did break down and it kind of pulled back into this range. If it got any further into the range, I would take it off my radar. But, yeah, I think this one could be in trouble – when you, if you go in and read the Go Go Nomo report, which I need to put, I guess I need to put free reports back on the, um, put it in the free members area. I didn't work on that. But if you go in and read that report, and if you sign up for free members, I'll I'll work to get those. Let me make a note. I'll add those free reports in. But the Gogo Nomo is basically saying you're looking for a big, thick stock if you're going to short something. And the thing about something like a big, thick stock like Netflix is everybody and their brother, as far as an institution, owns this stock. And you've got 50 million analysts. So if this thing begins to crack, it could crack pretty hard. And a lot of people could get hurt. 
Again, not my favorite setup. I'm, I'm trying to still find something that's a little bit cleaner and it's breakdown. I keep coming back to the GoDaddy because the GoDaddy, let me just clean this up. I got, I do some business with these people. I hope they're not watching. <laughs> but you can see what it broke down. It was a pretty serious slide lower. And then it was also a bow tie, pretty clean bow tying in here. So that's the kind of setup we're still looking for because the market's still at fairly high levels, okay? And then it sold off fairly hard. And even in this retrace, it was still in the early phases of just kind of pulling back again, okay? Meaning short setup on NVDA. Thanks for the clarification, Mike. Good to see you. Yeah, now this looks pretty good. Let's back the chart way out. Mike might be on to what I'm looking for. Let's see. Yeah, okay. This stock to me still looks like it still looks like it's at pretty high levels. It's dropped significantly. And you had a bow tie back here. Your bow tie trigger was here. Okay. But yeah, this is the type of stock you want to be shorting in this particular market. Something that's still at fairly high levels. Something that has a long, long ways to go. So yeah, I think that's a good job. You're welcome, Shauna. Glad you're here. There was a Shauna that I used to communicate a lot with a while back. Are you the same, Shauna? Like a put. Like a put or what, Clifford? ACA. Well, this is kind of a crazy one. I think I would wait for a secondary signal on this one just because it came public and dropped so hard on the first day. It's not bad, though. And it is making new highs. I mean, technically, it would be. Let's put it a five-day moving average. Short setup in NVIDIA. Okay, we'll take a look at that. We'll go back and get it. Oh, come on. Well, that'll work. Well, if you're using the five-day system here, then today, if it closes anywhere above, let's say, this high here. Well, let's just say a new closing high. Anything above 30 would be a buy on that. So it looks okay. I mean, you could certainly do much worse. And here's the deal. In a market that has become questionable, the more speculative issues can sometimes trade contra to the overall market. I don't know what AC does, ACA does, but I would find out. And if somebody wants to look it up, that'd be great. But they probably don't have earnings and they're probably not held to some sort of PE or standards or whatever. And they're not overanalyzed. So it could be a lot more inefficient and they're not so worried about the overall action in the overall market. Or like buy a put on the video. Um, one thing you can do, and I don't want to get into it too much, but if you have my first book, there's a chapter in there on buying puts or whatever as a substitution for stock. And somebody was asking me about this recently too. So this kind of dovetails nicely into a little lesson. Let's say you want to short 200 shares of the stock. Let's just use 200 round number, 200 times 200. So you've got to put up $40,000 to short 200 shares of this stock. Well, that's a lot of money, okay? And if the video comes out tomorrow and says our, what do they make, graphic cards or whatever, our graphic cards are the best bit mining card in the world and everybody is going to rush out and buy their graphic cards or whatever or allegedly going to buy their cards and the stock shoots up. 30, 40, 50 points overnight. Well, you're going to be kind of a hurt and pop. Well, one thing you could do, and it's not easy, don't get me wrong, okay, but it still kind of amazes me that this could actually work, is if you look deep into the money, instead of putting up $40,000, maybe you could put up a couple thousand dollars and buy some puts, the same amount of puts, two puts, by going deep into the money the further you go into the money with a put or a call for that matter the more fluff or extrinsic value 
comes off. If you're buying an at the money call or at the money put, then 100% of what you're paying is what I call fluff or extrinsic value. You're paying for that option. You're paying for that insurance policy, okay? Well, the cost of that policy goes down significantly the further you go into the money. The trade-off, of course, is you're putting more money up and you have more money to lose. But if you look into deep in the money puts, a lot of times they can work as a great substitution for stocks. So, yeah. So I don't I don't have the screen in front of me to pull that up. I actually put my trading station on the other side of my office to keep me from doing things like micromanaging and day trading too much. Short on Facebook. FB. Oh, cool. Well, good to see you, Shauna. Yeah, Shauna was was uh, one. And that's one reason that I started the Facebook group in the members area, and we're we're slowly getting a little traction there. It's going to be a slow start. I know how these things work, but that's one reason uh, Shauna and another trader that I was friendly with. I put those two together, or somehow they got together, and this is especially true for women because it's a lot harder for you guys to find other people. And I described this is all described the video that I did, and that's kind of the goal of the Facebook group is to put you guys together and work. We could all work as a team, and and I make mistakes, do th some things, stupid things too on occasion, and I I myself would like to kind of bounce some ideas off of other people and all too. I'm not the be all end all, you know. I still struggle with this like everyone else does. And I think that when you start working together as more of a group, and my ultimate goal would be to have like a mastermind group for those of us who, or for those of you, I should say, who graduate further and further up. And I think that together, collectively, we could probably do a whole lot. But that's a few years down the road. But in the meantime, yeah, the reason I had the Facebook group is so you guys could start to um, connect. And yeah, this beautiful relationship developed. Uh, beautiful platonic relationship with the markets. Okay, Facebook. Well, the problem with Facebook, obviously, you had the huge gap down. And I f usually it's hard to trade a market once they have a big gap like that. But I hear you. It's in a downtrend. And I would never buy the stock that looked like this, okay? I know never say never, but that looks pretty ugly. Yeah, this is a stock in a lot of trouble. I would At this juncture... I would wait for something like a sharp retrace and something like Facebook before going after it. Credit agro. Okay, so it's some sort of credit company. ACA. Race is a short. That's Ferrari. Well, it's a little wide and loose, but here's the thing. Most of these shorts are going to be a little wide and loose. Yeah, I think this is a stock that's in trouble. I don't want to confuse the issue with facts, but if the stock market starts getting a little iffy, a lot of these buy and hold types that hold held on for a long, long time or people who believe in holding on, they're going to see their portfolios hit pretty hard. And it's going to be hard to justify going out and buy that new Ferrari. It looks okay. It's a little wide and loose. That's the only thing that kind of bothers me with this one. But I can't argue with you that it could be in trouble. But in a case like this, I'd almost like to see a sharper retrace. I'm going to pass because it's wide and loose and maybe needs a shorter retrace. But, yeah, absolutely, Phil. I could see where you would see that stock is in trouble. Sure. All right, any more? All right, going once, going twice. Well, while we're in impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time. Oddly busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, shoot me an email. It'll become fodder for the next show, more than likely, given the schedule lately. But uh, just let me know. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.